League of Women Voters of Wayne County and the Democracy Institute Consortium here at Henry Ford College are pleased to present an evening to prepare for the November 6th midterm election. We use midterm to refer to an election that is in a non-presidential year. You may have noticed some informational tables in the atrium as you entered. It's always interesting to see whatever other organizations and organizations have, and there's some really great information there, so I hope that you'll take a look on your way out if you missed some of it on your way in. Um, and if by any chance you're not registered to vote, Tuesday is the deadline for this coming election on November 6th. If you are a citizen and are either already 18 or will be by or on election day, and we have registered people whose birthday is election day um, this year, then please, there are organizations like the League of Women Voters up there happy to take your voter registration tonight. Before we begin with the first of the two events, I'd like to introduce Dr. Lori Gunko from the Henry Ford College, who will give a very brief She'll give a welcome. She must be right around here, <laughs> yes, behind me. And, and a, a brief explanation of, the, for, of a ballot proposal for those of you who, how many of you are in the Dearborn Public School District, live in the Dearborn? So quite a few of you are. So this will be on your ballot. Thank you. Lori. Good evening, I'm Lori Gonko. I am the Interim Vice President of Institutional Research, Planning, and Accreditation here at Henry Ford College, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all to tonight's event presented by the League of Women Voters. Here at the college, we feel a very strong affiliation with community organizations like the League. The League has worked since 1920 in order to engage citizens in the decisions that are going to impact their lives. We have worked here at Henry Ford College to engage citizens in education in order to positively impact student lives and help the community to build a better future. According to the group's guiding principles, the League believes in access to public education for all. We here at the college, are, we are a public community college who serves students from all walks of life. We clearly believe the same. The group believes that democracy depends upon the informed and active participation of all of its citizens. Again, we share this philosophy and this is reflected in our institutional learning outcomes here at the college. Our learning outcomes are the things that we want all of our students to learn during their time with us and these include civic engagement, critical thinking, and communication. The League believes that cooperation with other nations is essential, and we at HFC have a long-standing commitment to being a welcoming college, and in a spirit of mutual respect, we actively foster connection, openness, understanding, tolerance, and so on. So for these reasons and many more, uh, we are very pleased to uh, have you all here this evening, and we value the important work of the League. As tonight's event is focused on preparation for the midterm election, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that HFC has a ballot renewal proposal on, um, the, I'm sorry, a ballot, uh, HFC has a millage renewal proposal on the ballot this November. Uh, one mil of our operating budget is set to expire uh, this year, and in order to continue to receive that funding, we have to place it on the ballot for voters to consider. One mill renewal is going to cost uh, the voters approximately $54 per year or $4.50 per month. And in the event that uh, this is uh, passed, HFC has a few initiatives that we plan to engage in in order to use this funding. $2 million per year is going to be used in uh, increased staffing costs, and this includes adding new faculty positions in our high demand programs, as well as uh, adding student services staff in areas such as counseling, advising, tutoring, career services, and so on. All of those areas that are going to increase our student retention and completion rates. We intend to use $300,000 per year in facility maintenance costs, and this includes adding uh, what we call soft spaces for students, which are studying spaces, gathering spaces, and so on. 
We will use $800,000 per year in order to uh, do what we're calling the Integrated Energy Management Project, and this is going to ultimately reduce uh, our energy costs at the college 40 to 60 percent over the course of the next several years. Last but certainly not least, we're going to use $300,000 per year in order to uh, add new state-of-the-art technology in our classrooms. In the event that uh, we do not receive our one mill renewal, this will uh, significantly diminish the plan that I just outlined, and we will not be able to do all of these things with um, you know, diminished budgets. So if you want more information on our millage renewal campaign, as well as the college, I encourage you to pick up one of our informational materials that's out in the atrium. And thank you for allowing me to be a part of your evening, and thank you for being our partners in educating the community. Thank you very much. This is Thursday, October 4th, and we are taping this forum at Henry Ford College in Dearborn. My name is Betsy Cushman, and I am a member of the Dearborn Dearborn Heights Board of Directors and also the State Board of the League of Women Voters. There are four leagues in Wayne County, and we have worked together to present this program tonight. In addition to the Dearborn League, the other leagues are Detroit, Gross Point, and Northwest Wayne County. So you have seen or will see um, members of our league in various roles tonight. We want to thank everyone who helped with the arrangements. Um, not only the league, but Dr. Tony Perry and Henry Ford College, including the student volunteers. Um, how many of you will be voting for the first time on November 6th? Few of you, few of you will. We especially hope that you will enjoy this program and feel more informed when it comes time to vote. As Dr. Ganko said, the League is a national nonpartisan organization and we really want you to be active and we really care that you vote. We never support or oppose political parties or candidates. And to help you all prepare, we do uh, a variety of things at election times, including voter guides. So if you live in Dearborn or Dearborn Heights, there are voter paper voter guides. But everyone can go online, wherever you live, to vote411.org, put in your address, and find your, what's going to be on the ballot before you vote. It really stops surprises. That's just a wonderful thing to have ahead of time so that you actually feel prepared. You know what's going to be on your ballot, what the races, what the ballot proposals are going to be. So I am, with that, I am going to go to the next page. Um, the three ballot proposals, statewide ballot proposals, which made it through to the general election have grabbed a lot of attention in the last year. And sometimes it's, you hear a lot of conflicting information. So we are especially pleased to welcome our State League President, Judy Kranjeff, who has a distinguished history in research and analysis on major and minor policy issues, in addition to leadership in many organizations before her election as President of the League. Thank you, Judy, for agreeing to make tonight's presentation. And this will be on the ballots for everyone who votes in Michigan this fall. So it's my pleasure. Welcome, Judy. Thank you, Dr. Thank you all for being here. I just want to make sure you have one handout because we won't be reading the language when it appears on the webs on the PowerPoint, but it'll be helpful for you to have it, and our viewers will be able to see it when they are looking at the tape. So uh, what are the ballot proposals and what would they do? We have prepared a presentation so that we can tell you what the ballot language is and the, how the proposals work. And then we provide the pros and cons provided by the major supporters and opponents. The league is not responsible for the 
uh, views or facts of those groups when we get to the pros and cons. We've tried to be as unbiased as possible in the educational part. So the overview of the uh, three proposals, three proposals were placed on the ballot through citizen petitions, meaning people signed a petition and we got them on the ballot. The number varied. Some of you may have signed a petition. According to um, one organization, Michigan has had 38 measures appeared on the ballot uh, since 1996 through 2015. There were none in 2016. 18 of those 38 measures were approved, while 20 were defeated. So we have one that's a voter-initiated law and two that are constitutional amendments. And that's important to remember on, because you can see what can happen to them, and I'll try to explain that on each proposal. It only takes a simple majority of the voters at the November election to pass these. And a voter-initiated law takes effect 10 days after the election and the vote's been declared. And a constitutional amendment takes place 45 days after the date of the election. So can the legislature change a constitutional amendment by the voters? Remember I told you two of these proposals are constitutional amendments. The answer is no. Only voters can make changes in a constitutional amendment in another general election. Can the legislature change a law if it's passed by the voters? What we talked about with the voter-initiated law. Yes, they can, by three-fourths of a vote. And some of you might remember when we voted not to hunt wolves and we passed the emergency manager law, the legislature did, did just that. They changed them. And they can because they had three-fourths of the vote. So the first proposal, 18-1 is what it's referred to on your ballot, is to regulate marijuana like alcohol. And this is a new law. This is the voter-initiated one that could be changed by the legislature. Proposal 18-2, is referred to as the voters, not politicians, petition, and it amends the Michigan Constitution. And Proposal 18-3 is the promote the vote petition, which amends the Constitution. So you can see numbers two and three would have to be voted on again by the people if changes were made. The first one could be changed by the legislature with a supermajority. So I'm going to start with Proposal 1, regulate marijuana like alcohol. This is the language that will appear on the ballot. Uh, the State Board of Canvassers Act and the Bureau of Elections for the Secretary of State are allowed 100 words, and they determine what's going to be placed on the ballot, not the groups that oppose that are supported. This is the language you have on your uh, handed out. I'll just read what's in green, the summary. A proposed initiated law to authorize and legalize possession, use, and cultivation of marijuana products by individuals who are at least 21 years of age and older and commercial sales of marijuana through state licensed retailers. So what does this proposal do? It creates the Michigan Regulation and Taxation of Marijuana Act. Some of you will remember that in 2008, we passed a medical marijuana law. This is a new one. It's not amending that. Uh, it legalizes recreational use of marijuana. And I've learned a lot 
Um, I'm probably going to have a lot of pop-ups on my computer about my marijuana use. But uh, it, under this proposal, you will be able to possess 2.5 ounces or lower of marijuana in public. And to put that in perspective, that would be equivalent to about 140 joints that you could carry in public. Colorado allows one ounce. That was the first state that passed that, so you have some perspective. A household can have up to 10 ounces, or 560 joints, but they have to, some of that has to be locked up in a secure place. It doesn't matter how many people live in that household. Local governments can place harsher, harsher restrictions on marijuana businesses than the state, and they can actually cap the number of commercial places. So there is local control. It also legalizes the cultivation and the sale of marijuana. This will be housed in the Michigan Department of Licensing and Regulatory Affairs. Right now, the medical marijuana is under a board. And this is different. This is a department which has staff. Uh, the uh, bureau will be, or the department will be able to grant six types of licenses. They cover the cultivators, the processors, transportation, everything. So different, six different licenses will go through the Michigan Department. Um, there are caps on the number of plants that could be in a home as well as in different size businesses, which gets a little complex for us, but just so you know that. It permits taxing revenue from commercial marijuana facilities. And I'm going to switch to another slide, and I know this is out of order, and I apologize. But um, there was an article just recently in the free press, so I think it's important to look at this. Where does the money go? First, the money goes to pay for the program. So all expenses in the Department of Licensing and Regulation will be funded by the revenue that's collected. It's going to be taxed at a 10% excise tax and a 6% sales tax. So if you're talking about $200, I believe, for an ounce, um, you can imagine the 16% on top of that going to the state. The second place money goes for the first two years is to fund FDA research analyzing the benefits of marijuana. And then the remainder is divided this way. 35% to the school aid for K through 12 public education, 35% to the Michigan Transportation Fund for repair and maintenance of roads and bridges, 15% to municipalities where the businesses are located, so local governments get some of the money, 15% to the counties where marijuana business is located. So how much could be generated? According to a study, they think it'll average about $134 million annually for the state. The opponents say it'll be more like $42 million. It's hard to know because we don't know how many people are going to take advantage of the new businesses. Uh, but I think you need to have a perspective on this windfall of money. Right now, the lottery for Michigan, the lottery that we have that puts money into the school aid, raises about $900 million a year. So this is a lot less than the lottery currently. And when you look at our general fund budget that's used to fund our programs, such as our state K through 12 and our colleges, we're talking about $5 billion. So this, uh, you need to look at that in terms of percentages. So then, 
We, number four is we permit creating administrative rules so the department can promulgate them if necessary, and we prescribe penalties. And I thought the penalty most people would like to know more about is those under the age of 21. If they possess an otherwise legal amount of marijuana, they would be fined $100 to $500 and they would have to complete a four to eight hour drug education program. For those people, this has come up in a lot of presentations, some people are concerned about the people that are in jail now under the old law. This has no impact on them. That their penalties still stand. When they were drafting this, some of the drafters wanted to include something retroactive for those people in jail under the old law, the current law, uh, and it, they weren't able to do it because it would take another petition drive, because it amends a different section. So to, uh, just for little information, Washington State levies a tax of 37% sales tax. We're looking at 16. And Colorado does 15 excise and 15 sales. Alaska does $50 per ounce. So between the nine states that currently have it, there's different uh, revenues, as you can see. The, um, these are the nine states in the dark gray, green that have legalized recreational and medical marijuana. And you can see they're mostly on the west coast in Colorado and on the east coast. And then those with the lighter, or the blue, those are legalized medical marijuana states. So then, we talked about that. This is what the supporters say. The supporters say sensible, this is a sensible alternative to Michigan's failed policy of marijuana prohibition. The positions Michigan has as a national leader in the adoption of smart adult use marijuana laws creates state regulated system of licensed marijuana businesses and it enacts an excise tax on marijuana at the retail level in addition to the standard state sales tax. This comes from the groups supporting this coalition to regulate marijuana like alcohol. They have a website and a lot of information there including their petition if you want to look up more information. And who are they in the coalition? that formed this, this isn't all their supporters, this is the coalition that wrote the proposal and circulated. It includes the American Civil Liberties Union, the Marijuana Law Section of the State Bar of Michigan, the Marijuana Policy po Project, Michigan Legalize, Michigan Cannabis Coalition, Michigan Normal, National Patients Rights Association. So what do the opponents say? Why legalized recreational marijuana is bad for Michigan? The recreational marijuana industry targets our youth. Recreational marijuana makes for dangerous drivers. Today's marijuana is not your, par mar your parent, <laughs> today's marijuana is not the marijuana your parents used. Recreational marijuana increases criminal activity, and there are better alternatives to recreational marijuana legalization. The group opposing it is the Healthy and Productive Michigan Coalition. Again, they have a website with information about them and their supporters. And recreational marijuana is not good for our economy. Uh, who's in that coalition? The Committee to Keep Pot Out of Neighborhoods and Schools, the Michigan Chamber of Commerce, and Smart Approaches to Marijuana Action. Two things I didn't bring up on that proposal were there are provisions that if you're a landlord, you can ban marijuana in your rental facility. 
And also, employers can drug test for marijuana either before you're hired or after you're hired, and you can be fired for it. Uh, and of course, the driving laws, while intoxicated, would include marijuana, so they're already prohibited. So proposal two, voters, not politicians. This amends the Michigan Constitution, uh, and it's a proposed constitutional amendment to establish a commission of citizens with exclusive authority to adopt district boundaries for the Michigan Senate, Michigan House of Representatives, and the U.S. Congress every 10 years. And just as a quick reminder, right now when we do uh, the districts, they're done every 10 years after the census, and the legislators draw the lines, they're approved by the governor, they go through the legislative process. That's how we do it currently. And this would amend the Constitution, so again, it can't be changed by the voters, and it establishes a Citizens Redistricting Commission in charge of the redistricting process, takes it out of the hands of the legislature and the governor. The commission will be made up of four Democrats, four Republicans, and five independents with representation across the state. Politicians, consultants, and lobbyists, and others will be banned from serving on this commission. The Citizens Redistricting Commission is required to conduct its business in public hearings that are open around the state, and all pro proposed maps and data that are used are also open to the public. The Citizens Re uh, Redistricting Commission is required to follow a prioritized set of criteria and standards when drawing the map. When the maps are adopted, a minimum of two Democrats two Republicans and two independents, and obviously one other in order to get to the seven, have to approve the final maps. So this prevents one political party from controlling the process. The source for this is Voters Not Politicians and their website uh, for some of the information about the redistricting commission. So the proposal contains a process and timetables. It's nine pages long. We're not going to go through it in its entirety, um, but you can see it on the website. I think people are very interested in how you apply for membership and how those members are selected, since we're talking about 13. And I pulled this slide in because it's been easier than trying to explain it. Right, what'll happen if this passes is that the Secretary of State's office will mail out 10,000 applications randomly to voters. And then others can mail in their application. The application will be available on the website. So there'll be two ways to get applications. From those applications that are sent in, there'll be six buckets and they will go into the Democratic members that came in from the mailing to 10,000, the, the bucket for those that applied, same with the Republicans and independents. So you'll have six buckets. They're going to draw out of those buckets 30 Democrats, 30 Republicans, and 40 independents. And then they're going to take from each of those six buckets. So then they're going to take those 60 Republicans, 60 Democrats, and 80 independents, and they're going to submit them to the legislators, leg, legislative leadership, minority and majority party. And they get to strike a total of five. Then all of those are going to come back. So if we're adding that up, 
It's 200, they get to strike 20. We got 180 that are coming back for a random draw of the 13. So that's how they get the, the membership. Um, they will re be required to hold public hearings, 10 before they start drawing the maps, and then more hearings after the maps are drawn. They expect this process to last about two and a half years. Uh, from starting before while the census is out and then completed and gone through probably a court process. People that are selected will be paid about 40000 a year. It's one quarter of the governor's salary. It's specified that in the proposal. It's also specified in the proposal that a quarter of the Secretary of State's current budget so we're talking about $4.3 million will be allocated to pay for this program. And if it lasts two and a half years, you're talking about $10 million. They will be audited. There's nothing uh, so that to make sure that $10 million is spent properly. But that's all estimates because we haven't done this before. Uh, there are specified criteria to determine the districts, and they're pretty complex, but they include what's required under the Voting Rights Act to make sure they're equal in population and contiguous and other things. And then they adopt the redistricting plan, and uh, we go forward. The supporters say voters should choose their politicians, not the other way around. Allowing politicians to draw their own districts is a conflict of interest, and it puts the fox in charge of the hen house. When politicians have the power to draw voting maps, they have the power to handpick their voters. Again, this is their website, Voters Not Politicians, where you can get more information. This is a long list. Voters Not Politicians is not a coalition of organizations. It's a coalition of individuals. But as you can see on their website, a number of organizations have endorsed them. They're not on the st steering committee or anything. That's that group of individuals. But they are endorsers. Just in, oh, because I want to be open about this, I wear two hats. I'm president of League of Women Voters of Michigan Education Fund, which is sponsoring this program tonight. It's our C3. I'm also president of League of Women Voters of Michigan, our C4, and that group has endorsed voters, not politicians. And then, this is the summary by the opponents. The proposed redistricting ballot proposal would drastically rewrite Michigan's Constitution to change the basic foundation of state governing structure by removing the voice of the governor, legislature, and courts in the redistricting process, replacing three branches of government with a randomly drawn 13-member commission that would be unelected and unaccountable. The ballot proposal would also place an inordinate amount of power in the hands of the partisan Secretary of State, thus favoring one political party over the other and generating divisive partisanship, public discontent, and distrust of the electoral process. This came from legal counsel Jim Holcomb, who works for the Michigan Chamber of Commerce. The, um, Organizations that are opposing this, they do not have a coalition, at least not yet, uh, but they um, seem to be using a ballot question committee called Protect My Vote, and Michigan Chamber of Commerce opposes it, and the Michigan Republican Party opposes it. Just recently, some mailings have gone out in Ann Arbor from the Michigan Republican Party opposing it. I don't know if any of you have received anything, and we learned today in Leland on Grand Traverse, they're going door to door. So there is opposition um, to this proposal. And that those mailings have been sponsored by the Michigan Republican Party. 
And last, proposal three is promote the vote petition. This is the third one, and it amends the Michigan Constitution. So voters, not politicians, and promote the vote are the two constitutional amendments that could only be changed by the voters. Um, whoop, sorry. Um, there's the ballot language. Again, this was chosen by the Secretary of State's Election Bureau and the Board of Canvassers. It says, a proposal to authorize automatic and election day voter registration, no reason absentee voting, and straight ticket voting, and add current legal requirements for military and overseas voting and post-election audits to the Michigan Constitution. Should this be adopted, yes or no? So what does this proposal do? It provides a common sense approach to safeguarding our elections. It puts voters first and removes barriers for working families, according to the people that put it on the ballot. First of all, it protects the right to vote a secret ballot. You're probably thinking you already have that, but you don't in Michigan. In the, in the Michigan Constitution, it tells the legislature to pass a law protecting the secret ballot. So that's what we have is a law that protects the secret ballot, which, as you all know, can be changed. So this puts it into the Constitution. 39 other states have this in their Constitution. Number two, it ensures the military service members and overseas voters overseas voters get their ballots in time for their votes to count. Right now, the federal government and state government have laws that say it should be 45 days prior to the election. So ours were supposed to have been mailed on September 22nd. They should have already gone out and been received. Since it's a law with that 45 days, this group decided to put it in the Constitution so it couldn't be changed. There have been trouble with military and overseas people getting their ballots back, getting it in time in order to get it back and be counted. And then the third is provide voters with the option to vote straight party ticket. Some of you might be aware when you go in, you can see a ballot on one side. It allows you to vote straight party and it gives you all the parties. And on the front side of that ballot you picked up out front for Wayne County, it would say uh, which parties, and that's the partisan election on the front. The back is the nonpartisan side. Some of you may not know when we had straight party ticket voting, you could also, if you voted Democratic as your party, you could still vote for a Republican and it would be counted even though you marked straight party. But a few years ago, the in 2015, the legislature passed a law and they banned straight party ticket voting in Michigan. We've had it 127 years, since 1891 here in Michigan. And uh, we, it, the legislature banned it twice before, but the people voted on it and put it back. So the legislature this time when they voted on it did the same thing they did on emergency manager. They put in an appropriation so you couldn't vote on it. So a lawsuit was filed and it's still going through the courts. And on sep uh, last election in 2016 when it should have gone into effect, there was a stay. So it didn't take an effect in 2016 election. The stay was removed September 5th. And a lot of people don't know this. So there will be no straight party ticket voting in this election. This would put it into the Constitution so the legislature couldn't change it. Michigan has the 12th longest lines in the nation in 2016. In uh, 2012, we were up to the sixth longest. We have one of the longest ballots in the United States. They, uh, so we'll see what happens with this one. And then automatically register citizens to vote at the Secretary of State's office unless the citizens decline. 
Some of you probably remember when you go in to get your license or change your tags for your car. They may ask you after you've been there a long time, do you want to register to vote? Well, most people by that time are ready to get out the door and say, no, thank you. This would have, uh, th they would work the other way this time and say, well, go ahead and register if you're not voted unless, you do, unless you're not registered. Well, go ahead and register you unless you're not, um, unless you don't want to be registered. So this would be opt in and you would opt out. I mean, um, so we'll, uh, this is done right now around in 14 states and the District of Columbia. It's opting out instead of opting in under our current program. Next is allow a, system, a citizen to register to vote any time with proof of residency. Right now we have one of the earliest deadlines uh, it's coming up next Tuesday, 30 days before an election. Uh, this would allow you to register uh, up to 15 days by mail. Uh, through, on, uh, you'll be able to, instead of 30, it'll go to 15. And then between the 14th and including election day, you could register in person with your proof of residency and everything else you have to have in order to register to vote. The next issue is to provide all registered voters access to an absentee ballot for any reason for 40 days prior to the election. As you'll see in a minute near the end, we have seven criteria, one of which you have to meet to get an absentee ballot. Uh, this would say there's no reason for you not to be allowed an absentee ballot. You just have to ask for it. 37 states and the District of Columbia already have this. And then last is to ensure an accurate and a, the accuracy and the integrity of elections by auditing election results. All of you are going to think we have this in Michigan. We don't. There is no way we can audit the elections. This would be a system sort of like you getting your tab at the end of a meal at a restaurant, and you can look at the bill and make sure that's what you ordered and what you're paying for. A similar uh, audit can be done for elections. Colorado's doing it already. They've been a leader on this. Uh, so this would be the last provision and the sources promote the vote in their website. And every per uh, the supporters say, every eligible person can vote and every vote will count. Make voting accessible, secure, and fair. And everyone deserves to have their vote secure and counted. They also have a website for more information. There is a coalition in Promote the Vote that is organizations, and they are the ACLU, the League of Women Voters C4 that I mentioned, the Michigan League for Public Policy, the NAACP of Detroit, and the NAACP of Michigan. And then there's a lot of people and organizations that have endorsed it that's on the website. So what does the opposition say? While the proposal seemingly has some good parts like secret ballots, post-election audits, and helping military personnel cast ballots, those items are already written into law. And their inclusion in this proposal serves only to mislead voters about its true purpose. Vote no on proposal three. So who opposes this? There's a ballot question committee, again, the same one for voters, not politicians. Protect my vote. And we think the Michigan Republican Party opposes it, and, uh, but we don't have uh, anything from the Michigan Chamber. Uh, so in closing, I just want to remind you about election information, because there's a lot of other information that you have. 
Hopefully you have something similar to this that you picked up out on the table to remind you, but the League works hard throughout the United States to put information on www.vote411.org for election information, and you can also check your registration. Absentee ballots became available September 22nd, but we've heard around the state that a lot of clerks have only just received them and they have not been mailed out. So if you don't have yours, don't be surprised, but they should be coming. If you don't receive it, check with your clerk. The last day for registering to vote is Tuesday, October 9th. Remember, we have that 30-day deadline. Election day is Tuesday, November 6th, and the polls are open from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. And these are the reasons that you can get an absentee ballot under current law. And a lot, of pe a lot of clerks are encouraging you to get an absentee ballot this year because of the change in absentee voting. Um, they include age 60 years or older, unable to vote without assistance, expecting, doesn't say you have to prove it, that you're gonna be out of town, in jail awaiting arraignment or trial, unable to attend the polls due to religious reasons, and appointed to work as an election inspector. If you're a first-time voter in Michigan and you registered by mail or with a group such as us, the League of Women Voters, you may have to submit your application in person at the clerk's office so they can verify your proof of residency and you cannot get it through the mail. That's something you'll need to check. And then student voting, and this is way too many words, but I just thought I'd include it. Um, your driver's license or your proof of identity that you're using at the poll, that address has to be the same as your polling place. So uh, make sure you know where you can vote. If you change your um, residency to vote, you move it to your school, remember that changes your driver's license automatically. The two are tied together. And this is the difference without the straight party ticket. The column that says straight party ticket will be eliminated. So everyone will mark every vote office they're voting for. And some confusion may result if you don't remember, for example, on the State Board of Education, you get to vote for two. So take your time to look at the ballot before you go to vote in person so you can go through this process easily and with confidence that you're choosing what you wanted to. Are there any questions? I know I've gone through a lot and we're running out of time. <laughs> What, um, today we had a uh, press conference at the league office and there were three clerks there and they said because all of this is automated information, you would be checked on the computer by the state and that wouldn't happen. Okay. I mean, that's what they said at the press conference. Uh, there, it, this is not specified in the ballot proposal how this is going to work. So the Secretary of State would promulgate rules and look at other states. Minnesota's had this for 30 years, and so have two other states. So uh, I think there are examples we can use to make it work correctly. All of, our, all of your polling places right now are supposed to have a laptop with a qualified voting, file, qualified voting file there on that laptop. And it's only used one time on election day. And that's downloaded from the state. If they have a paper copy they're using, it's been printed from that. 
but the laptop is the most reliable. Okay. okay. If marijuana has to be locked in a secure place, would that give the government more freedom to break in our houses at the expense of our freedom? I don't really know the answer to that question. <laughs> it does have to be locked up, but I don't know how they uh, regulate that. And if the government doesn't break into our houses, how are they going to make sure marijuana is locked up in a safe place? Yeah, I think it's just the threat that we abide by. Um, the statewide city clerks oppose the amendment to mandate voter registration up to and including same day registration. Um, that's not true. The clerks today said that wasn't true. There are three clerks association, so I don't know of any one and that three of them today said no associations opposing it. They have some clerks, there are 1,500 in Michigan. We have the most decentralized state system in the United States. So out of those 1,500, I'm sure there are clerks that oppose it. Uh, but obviously, um, the, pat, the it says, did proponents consult city and county clerks? Yes. And a lot of them are adamantly supporting this. Uh, it will be developed on how it's going to work out with rules and regulations by the Secretary of State. The former elections director for the state of Michigan, Chris Thomas, who was there, I believe, 26 years, recently retired. He supports this. He's trying to talk to every clerk to say this can be done. He's doing ads for Promote the Vote. So I think it's important that we dispel bad information. Anything else? Got one more? This is okay. about the knowledge. Okay. I don't know the answer. <laughs> is somebody who knows? Is, is that one more question? We have a question about the millage. I don't know if yeah, Tony Henry or Ford somebody College. wants to come down. The question is a good one, but we don't have someone, I don't, unless we do, to answer. What's the current total millage rate for HFCC, and how does that compare, more or less, to the rate for Wayne County Community College Schoolcraft in Oakland? The uh, good to see you too. Uh, the rate that we the this uh, the initiative that we that Dearborn voters will be voting on in November is a one mill, and I think the total mills is four. Um, the actual mill the the rate the millage rate is um, is higher than other institutions in the in Michigan. However, the amount I was at a presentation earlier today on this that um, we are. Uh, receiving far less revenue per student than any other institution and that's uh, we have a much smaller tax base in Dearborn than for example uh, Oakland Community College has the entire Oakland County whereas Henry Ford College is uh, our ours is based just on the city of Dearborn plus a slice of Dearborn Heights so uh, the the rate is higher but we are drawing far less per student uh, than any of the other uh, institutions were near, near the bottom in terms of how much revenue we're getting, especially when you compare us to larger, uh, I'm sorry, to institutions that have fewer students than we do. Um, so, thank you. That helps. A question regarding absentee ballots how do you obtain them? You can go to your clerk's website or the Secretary of Web's, uh, State's website, Michigan.gov slash SOS, and you can print out an application for um, absentee ballot and mail it in, or you can go to your clerk's office and fill one out. You can actually vote right then. They'll give you the ballot and turn it back in. You don't have to mail it. Uh, it has to be returned by election day. On the Saturday before election, 
All um, clerks are required to be open until 2 p.m. The catch here is the law doesn't say what time they open. So that varies, but they can't close before 2 p.m. if you want to vote in person absentee on the Saturday before the election. Is it, is it not concerning that straight ticket voting would encourage low information voting? Is it really worth it to increase voter turnout with ignorant and apathetic voters? Right now, 50% of all people that vote in Michigan vote straight tar party ticket. So I don't think 50% of our voters are apathetic or uninformed. I think it makes it easier. And again, in Michigan, if you voted, wanted to vote straight Democrat, you can vote for a Republican for governor. And it doesn't do away with the rest of them being counted for a, as a Democrat. So I don't think that's what straight ticket voting does. But that was the argument in the legislature that passed it with an appropriation this time for the third time. Uh, why does the promote the vote proposal not allow cross-party voting for primary elections? We didn't address that issue at all. Right now you go in and you, like when I was in Oklahoma, you had to actually say, I want a Democrat ballot, ballot or a Republican ballot or a Green Party ballot. I had to tell the clerk that. Michigan, you get all of them in one. And then you make the decision which party you're voting in. We did not address that in the coalition. It didn't change. Anything else? I hope this has been inform informational. I know it's a lot of information. Um, but you're definitely more informed than a lot of voters who are going to go in their first day and read that wording up at the top. And that's the first time they're going to see the statewide ballots. So please educate others and help, uh, help us get more people to the polls to vote. Thank you.